Good morning. Thank you so much for joining me on today's Wednesday webinar. Today, we are going to be talking about social security disability for hearing loss. And before we get started, I do want to briefly mention that as is typical, today's Wednesday webinar is not considered legal advice, but instead is meant to give you some background information on the social security disability process. If you or someone you know are thinking about beginning that process with respect to hearing loss. I also do not answer any specific questions on the live webinar, um, and I do not answer any questions if you're watching the replay in the comments down below. Instead, what I ask is that you reach out to us directly. At the end of the webinar will be our contact information, phone number, email address. On the live video, we will drop in the comments a link where you can schedule a call with us. And on the replay, that link where you can schedule a call with us will be down below. So whatever is easiest for you, call, email, schedule a call, you can do that. The reason why I can't give specific advice is because I don't want you parading your information out there for everybody. And it's impossible for me to give specific advice without having a lot of extra details oftentimes. So that is why I've just kind of made that a blanket rule. This webinar hopefully will still be helpful um, from the background perspective. And again, if you have additional questions, I'm happy to speak with you, happy to answer any of those questions, but I just ask that you do it through phone, email, or by scheduling a call. Again, our phone number and email address will be posted at the end of the webinar, and a link to schedule a call will be dropped in the chat during the live webinar, and on the replay, that link to schedule a call will be down below. All right, with that out of the way, Today, we are going to talk about, as I said, Social Security disability claims for hearing loss. And in doing so, we will first cover some Social Security disability basics, then we'll move on to some guidance, and then we'll talk about some potential listings, additional considerations, and then finally, how an attorney might be able to help with your Social Security disability claim. A little bit about me before we get started. My name is Caitlin Wildoner. I'm the founding attorney of Beacon Disability, a law firm based in Florida, where we exclusively practice federal administrative disability law. By doing that, we assist clients throughout the United States with agency level social security disability and supplemental security income matters. That means that we handle cases from the initial application to the reconsideration stage to the hearing stage to the appeals council stage. Okay, talking about the basics. First of all, there are two different social security disability programs. Many people don't know this. There are There is SSDI, Social Security Disability Insurance, and then there's Supplemental Security Income, or SSI. Both programs require that you be disabled and unable to work for a period of at least 12 months. And both programs use that same definition of disability. Where they differ is with SSDI benefits, you must have sufficient work credits to qualify. Typically, that, must, that means that you must have worked five of the last 10 years. If you have not worked five of the last 10 years, which can differ if you're younger, um, there are certain exceptions to that rule, but that's kind of the rule of thumb we go by. Have you worked five of the last 10 years? Yes, okay, you should be able to qualify as long as your earnings in those five years were at a certain threshold. And then the other program is SSI. And with SSI, instead of that work history requirement, it has income and asset restrictions. So right now for assets, you cannot have more than $2,000 in assets if you are single and more than $3,000 in assets if you are married. It does not include one home that you live in and one car that you drive, but it does include bank accounts, investment accounts, retirement accounts, all of that, um, there's a lot of things that it does include and a few more that it, it does not. But by and large, that's kind of our rule of thumb for that. For assets is $2,000 in assets if you're single, you will not qualify. $3,000 in assets if you're married, you will not qualify. There are household income restrictions on top of that, um, which are a little more complex than, than just a blanket statement. So I don't get into those, but there are additional income restrictions for SSI as well. Social Security, when you submit your application, they begin to evaluate your case using a five-step evaluation process. At step one, the very first thing they look at is, well, first they look to see, do you qualify for SSDI or SSI using that additional prong? Either making sure you have the, the uh, requisite number of work credits or making sure that your income and assets are below the SSI threshold. 
Once you get there, then they begin this five-step process where they look to see first, are you engaging in substantial gainful activity? In 2022, that means, are you working 20 hours a week or more, or are you earning $1,350 a month or more in gross earnings? So before taxes, before any deductions, are you earning $1,350 a month or more? That's what they're going to look at. If you are not engaging in substantial gainful activity, they move to step two. If you are, the evaluation stops there. By Social Security's definition, you cannot be found disabled. So as long as you are not engaging in substantial gainful activity, Social Security moves to step two to look at, okay, do you have any severe medically determinable impairments? If you do not have at least one severe medically determinable impairment, the evaluation stops there. Social Security will find you not disabled. If you have at least one severe medically determinable impairment, then Social Security moves to step three, which is, okay, do you meet or equal a listing with your severe, repair, severe impairments? Sorry. Um, do you meet or equal a listing? If you do meet or equal a listing, the evaluation stops there and you will be approved. And we'll talk about the listings specific to hearing loss in just a minute. If you do not meet or equal one of those listings, then Social Security will move to step four, and in doing so, will create a residual functional capacity for you based on the medical evidence available in your file. That residual functional capacity, or RFC, is used to basically say what Social Security thinks you are capable of doing based on your physical and or mental impairments. So they will take that RFC and they will look to see, does somebody with that RFC, are they able to return to the past work you have done? They compare them. They look at the Dictionary of Occupational Titles to see, does that RFC allow for you to do that work as defined in the Dictionary of Occupational Titles or as you performed it, if there's a difference in that. If you can return to your past relevant work, Social Security stops the evaluation of your claim there and they will find you not disabled. They will say you are not disabled because you can go back and do your past work. If you cannot go back and do your past relevant work, Social Security moves to step five. They look at your RFC again and they say, can an individual with that RFC engage in any other jobs that exist in the national economy? And with that, they're looking at your age, your education, your past relevant work, any skills that you may have obtained from that past work. And then, of course, as I mentioned, the RFC. If you can engage in other work, then Social Security will ultimately find you to not be disabled. If you cannot engage in any other work, then Social Security will find that you are disabled according to their rules. So that is the, the basic breakdown of how that five-step evaluation process works. When it comes to Social Security's, the way they look at hearing loss, they look at it in, from two different lenses. If you've had a cochlear implant, they look at it in one respect. And if you have not, then they look at it differently. However, either way, they do often need to see audiometric testing to understand the severity. As you'll see in a minute, hearing loss treated with a cochlear implant will be considered disabled um, for a year after the implant. So that way they can see kind of how, how it helps you. However, without a cochlear implant or after that year, Social Security is going to be looking to see your speech reception threshold, your word recognition abilities, um, all of that kind of thing. And they're using the American National Standards Institute standards in evaluating that testing. And so to do that, each ear must be tested separately. You cannot wear hearing aids during the testing, and then you must have an exam immediately before testing as well in order for the testing in your file to be valid from Social Security's perspective, okay? The audiometric testing with a cochlear implant, as I mentioned, is a little bit different. And after that initial year, after the implant, Social Security will need to see word recognition testing. And as long as it's performed with a version of the hearing in noise test, the HINT, it's conducted in a quiet sound field, 
and the implant is functioning properly and adjusted to normal settings, Social Security will be able to use that testing to evaluate your claim. All right, so as you can see here, this is the first listing, it's 2.10. This is a hearing loss that's not treated with a cochlear implant. And it will require that you have an average air conduction hearing threshold of 90 decibels or greater in your better ear. And an average bone conduction hearing threshold of 60 decibels or greater, again, in your better ear. So Social Security is always going to be looking at, and we'll get to, to vision loss next Wednesday webinar, but today we're talking about hearing loss, but they're always looking at the better ear. With vision loss, they're looking at the better eye. So being deaf in one ear might not help you meet this listing if your other ear has an average air conduction hearing threshold below either of those thresholds. Does that make sense? So the other way you can get uh, meet the listing with 2.10 .2 is if you have a word recognition score of 40% or less, again, in your better ear, determined by using a standardized list of phonetically balanced monosyllabic words. Okay, so again, all of the testing that Social Security is doing that they're looking at, they're evaluating what your better ear can do. So that's important to remember. When it comes to hearing loss treated with the cochlear implant, as I've mentioned before, the listing will consider you to be under disability for one year after that initial implantation. If it's been more than a year, or in other words, after that first year following the implant, then Social Security is going to look at, do you have a word recognition score of 60% or less using the hint? Okay, so those are the two listings for hearing loss with Social Security disability. If you meet or equal one of those two listings, then Social Security will stop evaluating your case at step three and you'll be found disabled. If you do not meet or equal the listing, Social Security will create an RFC for you and they will go through steps four and five if necessary. All right, so we're coming to an end here. How can an attorney help you? As I've mentioned in all of the webinars, if you've watched any of them before, this is not an exhaustive list. Um, we can sometimes do a lot more than this. We can sometimes do not all of this, depending on when we're able to get your case resolved. Um, but basically, one of the, the things we're really good for is providing guidance on what correspondence from Social Security actually means. I have so many calls with clients and potential clients that are like, I have no idea what this form means. What are they looking for? How do I answer it? And of course, I can't ever tell you how to answer it. Only you know how to answer it because only you know what you go through on a daily basis. But what I can do is explain to you what Social Security is looking for and give you some tips and things to consider while filling them out. The other thing that we do is if you're already a client of ours and you get a denial letter, we can file necessary appeals after consulting with you again at the agency level. We review your medical records in your case file. We discuss what additional medical records might be helpful in your case, um, or sometimes non-medical records exist that can be helpful. We can also review your documents for accuracy and completeness. As I mentioned, we can't fill them out for you, but we can take a look at that and say, okay, this looks good. Um, or you know, if you're putting just one word answers and, and really you have a lot more to say, sometimes we can have that conversation and say, well, what do you, what do you mean by you know no or by yes? Um, you know, so, so that can be helpful as well. We work with you to provide relevant updates to Social Security throughout your claim, as well as back from Social Security to you. It helps to ensure that nothing really gets slipped through the cracks. If you are at the hearing level with us, we will prepare you for a hearing before an administrative law judge, and we can also question you and any other witnesses during the hearing, including a medical or vocational witness brought on by the Social Security Administration. The, so that's some of the things that we can do. As I mentioned, we can also do a lot more than that. Um, and if you don't go to the hearing level, then of course, we're not going to prepare you for that hearing. Um, if, if we're able to get your case resolved, that initial or reconsideration based on the medical records, um, that's wonderful. All right, again, as promised, here is our contact information. 
The link to schedule a call is also being dropped in the chat right now. The link to schedule a call will be down below on the replay. So feel free to do that. Um, in the meantime, here is our phone number, our email address. Our office is located in St. Johns County, Florida, but we can assist clients throughout the United States. If for some reason we cannot assist you, we do try to put you in contact with somebody who can and or answer questions that you have as your claim is pending. All right, so that is going to be it for today. Thank you so much for joining me. If you have questions, please feel free to reach out. I'm always happy to speak with you, always happy to answer any questions that I can. Um, thank you so much for joining. Have a wonderful day.